it ain't the left side or the right side, then it must be the fin side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fence Side here with Kat and Paul. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. The Dolphins get crushed on Thursday Night Football, as usual, 42-23. to Hard to believe at one point this was a 7 to nothing game at the end of the first quarter. The Dolphins' defense continues to be unable to really stop anybody. They lost their... They've lost now four of their last five games by 11 or more points. Paul, before I start out here, I I just want to throw out to you a comment that I heard from Joe Buck before about Matt Burke, before the game started. He said something along the lines of, you know, I talked to Matt Burke the other day about golf. And, God, he knows so much about golf. And (laughs) I really think he knows more about golf than he does about football. I mean. Uh, the, the the let me let me just throw some stats out here about uh, about for the Dolphins defense in the last eleven quarters the Dolphins defense has allowed one hundred and two points they've had only one sack and that's because the center fake snapped the ball and the tackles weren't ready opposing quarterbacks a quarterback rating of one forty five point three opposing running backs six point four six yards per carry I mean. What more can you say about this team right now other than it's failing defense? Yeah, for me, Burke's got to go. I don't think he should even make it to the bye week at this point. On top of that, I, I think it's time, as it has been for a while now, that Minka Fitzpatrick comes in for TJ McDonald. And there, there's confusion in the secondary as far as coverage goes. The D-line is not getting the pressure it needs to and not finishing the play when they do get there. And that's putting a lot of pressure on the secondary as well. I mean, one of the touchdown passes, I swear, it's like he had 47 seconds to throw the ball, and no defense is going to cover everybody for that long. Yeah, the the other thing that I do want to bring up here, too, is uh, why isn't David Fales playing? Uh, Osweiler can't throw up more than four yards. Our best deep ball came out of Danny Amendola's hands in this game, and the play calling on offense is absolute garbage. I mean, we need to get somebody in to call plays. We need to get somebody in to coordinate this defense. Without any of that, we're not going to go anywhere this year. Yeah, I mean, you brought up a lot of things there. And at quarterback, yeah, Brock Osweiler did not have a great game. And, look, I think we saw really vintage Brock Osweiler today. He can't throw the ball over the top. He dumps the ball off underneath for two yards and gets his receivers killed, which he did with Jakeem Grant and Mike Gusecki largely all game long. But I don't even think he is on the top five list of the biggest problems because, to me, defensively, I look at two things. Number one, Matt Burke. Number two, this defensive line is so bad, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, in the again, last 11 quarters of football, one sack, and that's only because of a of a play that shouldn't have even happened. I mean, I'm tired of with these former Bengals defensive coordinators that you line up the same players at the same spots every single play. And now it's it's so easy to prepare for. They can't pressure the quarterback and they can they can't even begin to think about stopping the run. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, watching the defensive line in this game, there were a lot of times either via positioning or stunt, I felt like they were being taken out of position to do anything positive. And and not only that, that includes occupying a blocker so the linebackers can do anything positive. I mean, what they're doing along that defensive line doesn't make anybody any friends here. I mean, it's, it's atrocious and it affects the whole defense. I can't remember which drive it was, but finally, after not getting any pressure on Deshaun Watson, the Dolphins started blitzing, and it worked for one drive, and then they stopped doing it. I don't know why they stopped, but they stopped. This guy is a jackass, and he needs to be fired tomorrow. He should be fired by the time we record this show, because this is legendarily bad on defense. Let's, uh, Let's get to the grades here, Paul. I'm sure they're not going to be very good. Quarterback, Brock Osweiler, 21 for 37, 200 and something yards. Uh, I would say looking at his performance here, he had an interception in the first half. Probably shouldn't have been, should have been pass interference. 
didn't, that was not called. But he also should have had about three interceptions called on him. And I, I don't understand when he's well protected on a third and short or a second and short how he he dumps the ball underneath for one yard. One of the most telling plays for me with Brock Osweiler is it is, I think, second and one. And it is a clear offside where, one, you just bomb the ball down the field and you don't care what happens. He dumps the ball off to Frank Gore for a loss. Really summarizes the entire day on offense. Still, Dolphins did put up 23 points, but on several gadget plays. Um, I'm going to probably be nicer than you with Osweiler. I'm going to give him a D plus. I'm going D minus here. It's there were a lot of things that caused for alarm. I'm glad you brought up that play where they had a free play and he dumps it to Frank Gore behind the line of scrimmage in what would have been a drive killer right there. Uh, you look at, you know, he was well protected on a few plays and still threw the ball into the stands, which disgusted me. Uh, I know he was 21 for 37, but about I'd say probably eight of those off the top of my head were plays where Devontae Parker or somebody made a Herculean effort to, to catch the ball. And, you know, the receivers bailed them out on a lot of plays here, a lot of plays here. So, yeah, the trail Jamerson dropped an easy interception early, but he was defending the ball from a ghost runner, I guess, out there. And there were a lot of balls that were nowhere close to the intended target. Easy touchdown to Devontae Parker where he overthrew him by about 15 yards. Just – all over the place, all day long. It was atrocious yeah. for Brock. And there were several plays he could have run for the first down, too. Yeah, and looking at Brock Osweiler, right before the half, it was 14-10. to 10. The Dolphins had the ball, too. Or, excuse me, it was a 14-7 to 7 at that point. And that's when that – no, no, excuse me, it was 14-10. So, Brock Osweiler – Dropped back and he threw the ball behind him. It should have been an inter- it should have been a fumble return for touchdown by Jamerson, who you actually interviewed uh, several months back uh, before the draft. He's a rookie this year. was was drafted by the Saints, but threw the ball behind him and it should have been a t- it should have been a touchdown for them. Was reversed. It shouldn't have been. That's another negative play. So the sad thing is, even though the Dolphins lost by 19 points, they had a lot of the calls go their way too. It could have been a lot worse. So. Let's move on to the running back spot. I know we are perpetually frustrated by Kenyon Drake and uh, another eye-popping stat with Adam Gase. So at one point in the middle of the third quarter, Kenyon Drake has nine carries or, or in the previous five and a half quarters, has I think nine carries for 106 yards over five quarters, and he's still not getting the ball. He did finish the game with two touchdowns. One on a first quarter run that put the Dolphins up seven to nothing. Another one on a throw by Danny Amendola that brought the Dolphins within four points at the time. So I have no problem with the running backs. I mean, Kenyon Drake obviously is explosive. Frank Gore, I feel bad for dogging on a lot because he runs very well, and the guy had four and a half yards of carry here. So I don't have a problem with what the running backs did. I'm going to give him a B plus. Yeah, I think we're going to see a theme here amongst our. our other positions on offense, because I thought overall most of the offense played very well outside of, you know, some sidearm Sasquatch. So I I can actually give the running backs an A-. minus. They did everything and more that was asked of them here. And Frank Gore, he had a good day. Kenyon Drake had a great day when he got the chance. It's What more can you say about these guys? Agreed. Looking at wide receiver, the big story of the day, Devontae Parker, six catches for 134 yards. I tweeted out during the week that knowing our luck, Devontae Parker's going to have six catches for 130 yards and the Dolphins are going to lose 27 to 24. He ends up with six for 134 and the Dolphins end up losing by 19. I can't tell you how big of a jackass Adam Gase looks for not even activating Parker over the last two weeks. Look, I'm not. This is not a case for Parker, but we saw the talent on display here today. And it, for him on a team that has this little talent to not at least be active is a joke. So, as looking, he had six catches for 134 yards. Amendola had his usual four for 40. He also had that touchdown throw to Kenyon Drake. Jakeem Grant caught some passes underneath. Mike Kosecki sucks. Uh, unfortunately, and I, I don't really see how that's going to get much better. And Nick O'Leary did a good job blocking. That's pretty much the rundown of the receiver unit. 
So I didn't have a big problem with them. I'm going to give them a B. Nick O'Leary came kick J.J. Watt on an early play, uh, which was awesome to see. Uh, Nick O'Leary had a pretty outstanding tackle on an interception return. I mean, it, Nick O'Leary continues to jump out whether he gets the ball in his hands or not. And Devontae Parker, you know, the goofy thing here is I think if he had been active all along when he felt okay-ish, I don't think we would have seen this performance from him. This was the yeah. first time I've ever seen him out there with something to prove, motivated, and focused, ever. And, yeah, this this shows exactly why we've had the tease of Devontae Parker for years. And it also shows why, you know, do they have to deactivate him for three games and activate him for the fourth every time for him to play like he should? I'm sorry. If you can't be focused enough and motivated enough on your own to play in the NFL, I, I'm still not sold. Not at all. And, I mean, I will say it was a great game from him in this one. But I'd be saying the same thing if he had 30 catches for 350 yards. It's just this was a one-game sample, and the, all other evidence points to the contrary. But he had a great game. Danny Amendola had a great game. I liked what I saw out of Jaheim Grant again in this one. And, yeah, Mike Kosicki, he is what he is. I mean, he's got the, the tools to be a special receiver, but – Again, they've got to call the right place for that, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. So I'll give the receivers an A-minus here because I thought they did, they actually had a good game despite the crap play from sidearm Sasquatch. Yeah, Parker, I – again, this isn't a point for me to say that I think the guy has come around. But, man, oh, man, it just it, – to, to put up the this yardage and not be active the last couple of weeks – is very, very much reminiscent of, of when Joe Philbin kept playing Daniel Thomas all the time. It, it's, yeah. it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You at least put him out there and put him out there for a few plays a game. So I'm glad that he at least showed something in this. But overall, yes, he's an underachiever. I'm going to throw it back to you, Paul, on the offensive line. I thought the offensive line played well here. I mean, you look at what Kenyon Drake did with the ball in his hands. He had holes to run through. Frank Gore had holes to run through here. And, yeah against a ridiculously good defensive front seven from, from Houston, they they did what they could to neutralize J.J. Watt and Jadavian Clowney and the rest of those guys. And, you know, I, I absolutely love when Juwan James, knowing that J.J. Watt was smoking him, went into pass protection on a running play, and J.J. Watt took himself out of the play. Bravo to him. I mean, yeah, Brock got sacked a couple of times. A few of them he was holding the ball too long, but – most of the problems from the quarterback position came from the quarterback, not his protection up front. I'll give these guys a B plus. Osweiler was sacked two times, uh, one by J.J. Watt, the other one on a uh, missed block by uh, Kenyon Drake where Tyron Matthew got the sack. But, yeah, overall, I, I thought Jawan James had a really rough first quarter against, J, against J.J. But then after that, he recovered very nicely. And they also gave him a little bit of help with Nick O'Leary. And J.J. is a different player. I mean, he looks more back to form, one of the best players in the NFL and a generational type of talent. On the other side, Laramie Tunzel goes up against Jadavian Clowney and has a phenomenal game. You did not hear Jadavian Clowney's name one time. And now, in two out of three weeks, going up against Khalil Mack and against Jadavian Clowney, or at least in some sets there, he completely shuts them out, and it seems like a reoccurring theme. Theme: This offensive line in general, I think, is the one position on this Dolphins team throughout the year that has continued to overachieve. And kudos as well to Travis Swanson, Jesse Davis, and Ted Larson on the inside, especially Travis Swanson. I mean, I, I think he's given us better center play over the last couple of games than we've seen in, I mean, really before Mike Pouncey was here. So, I really like this unit. I'm going to give them an A minus. So moving along to the defensive side of the ball, Paul. Like I'm already winded, and we're halfway through the show. I mean, I'm already so. I'm, I mean, I, I don't even know if I have the energy for this. I mean, let's let's uh, defensive line very simply. I'm they didn't either. F. So I, I mean, <laughs> I, I I just don't think. I mean, this front seven. I, I I can only blame Matt Burke so much too. I mean, like I I cannot tell you how many times. Lamar Miller gets the handoff 
and he's seven or eight yards down the field before there's even a hand put on him. I mean, that, that to me is, was the worst thing in this game, and it was the domino that fell on everything else. The defensive line could not force any pressure. They could not stand up anybody at the point of attack against the run. The, the second wave got to the linebackers, and then eventually, even though the defensive backs were playing well, they started to falter too badly in the fourth quarter. So starting with the defensive line, no pressure, nothing against the run. A couple of good plays by Akeem Spence, but other than that, nothing. I'm going to give him an F. I'm not going to give him an F here. I, I thought that they had a, a good first half. I will say that. Not great, but good. I thought there were a few pressures. Andre Branch did a few good things yet again. He seems to be starting to revert back to the form we saw before he signed the extension, which is a good and welcome sight to see. Um, Cam Wake looked a little more Cam Wake-ish. Robert Quinn disappeared yet again. And really after Vincent Taylor got hurt, that's when we started to see things slide for this defensive line because Vincent Taylor did hurt his foot uh, somewhere, I think, in the second quarter. So I'm not going to say that it, things were good there, but they weren't F worthy for me. Uh, I'm I'm going to go with a D plus. Yeah, I mean, I, I just can't cut them any breaks, especially with, you know, Cam Wake and Robert Quinn. Now I'm reaching to the point we're heading – Dolphins are heading into their eighth game now, and they have a combined two sacks on the year. And I know that there's been a lot of – injuries there I know Cam Wake is still playing with an injury but at a certain point when when he's not good against the run and he's he's not getting a sack and he's not getting forced fumbles and he's just getting a pressure every quarter I, I just can't do it anymore with this defensive yeah. line and to me it's the first domino that falls in every other single unit linebackers Paul I'm, because I don't have any energy to to continue to go through this crap uh uh <laughs> I'm just kidding uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to throw it back to you for the linebackers. These guys are a D here. Again, they had an okay-ish first half, but really fell apart in the second half. I I have to wonder how much of that is Matt Burke and failure to make halftime adjustments because we're seeing a lot of that as a theme this year where they have an okay first half and then fall apart in the second half. But – yeah, I got to go with a D for these guys. Yeah, when you look at Lamar Miller's long run, you're going to see Raekwon and Kiko get very tied up. In that you know, it's it's hard with those offensive linemen coming downhill for them to stand them up at the point of the attack. So some of that responsibility falls in the D line, some of it on the linebackers. I still go go back to that. I thought the linebackers were playing well the first few games when the defensive line was holding up their share of the responsibility. I'm going to go with a D here as well. Defensive backs, you know, one thing that I was hoping to hang my hat on is at the end of the third quarter, Xavier Howard shadowing DeAndre Hopkins all game held him to eight yards, and then Hopkins started going off. Also, Will Fuller had that 73-yard touchdown against Bobby McCain. Bobby McCain has let up a lot of big plays over the last couple of weeks. I still think he's playing with a little bit of an injury. Micah Fitzpatrick, still not many passes caught off him, and he he seems to make one or two kind of wild plays every single game. Last game when he chased down Carrion Johnson all the way across the field, this one here on a third and short. So, yeah, I'm I'm completely happy with the talent of the defensive backs, but when you look at the end of the day, over the last 11 quarters, the Dolphins have a, are holding quarterbacks to a quarterback rating of over 145. So, I'm going to give them a D plus. They probably would have been a B if not for the last quarter, but the last quarter was so bad. It takes down the grade so much. I'm going to go with a C for these guys. I thought Rashad had a good game. I thought Xavier had a good game. He got beat a little bit after he rolled his ankle on that uh, Hopkins push off. But, you know, overall I thought he had a solid game. TJ McDonald continues to, uh, play up to the atrociousness of the past few weeks. Uh, I'm, I'm very tired of every week seeing the long run ripped off where you see TJ take a bad angle and make a bad missed tackle, and then Rashad's got to chase the guy down 50 yards downfield to save a touchdown. I'm really over that fact at this point. It, it's time to get Mink in the starting lineup, bring TJ in in the nickel at that point. 
you know, it, it's I don't get it. Um, Bobby did have a little bit of a rough day at times late in the game, but like you said, I think he is still nursing something. And let's face it, it's still better than having Tori McTire out there. But they're also being asked to cover guys for, you know, 13, 14, 15 seconds some plays when the defensive line isn't doing their job up front. So I think some of it's a symbiotic relationship where they're being asked to cover for far too long for anybody in the NFL at this point. And yeah. no one's going to do that. To me, it starts with the defensive line and a good observation on McDonald. And on that, to me, the most important play of the game where the Dolphins were down by eight and just needed a stop. Uh, or excuse me, they were down by four and they just needed a stop. That long 73-yard touchdown by Fuller, even though McCain did not get a jam off the line, it looked like, based on the body language, T.J. McDonald, McDonald blew his assignment not Bobby McCain. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I, I like McDonald coming downhill against the run. I like him if they can use him creatively, but this much in coverage is not getting the job done. Special teams, Paul, I'll kick it back to you. Special teams played great today. Um, I didn't like not having Jakeem Grant back there, but I understand it on kickoff returns. But overall, I, I have no issue with the special teams. Jason Sanders – made a kick that that got called back on a weird, odd penalty where they hit uh, John Denny in the head or neck area on the snap. But really, Matt Hawk is back to Matt Hawk form, which is a good thing to see. I have no issues with it. There was a great punt return by Jakeem Grant. Special teams did everything asked of them. Bravo, Darren Rizzi. You have the one solid unit right now. Uh, I'll give these guys an A-minus. Yeah, I'll go with a B-plus for those same reasons. Uh, Jason Sanders is really starting to nail these field goals. In a game where the defense was worth a damn, these kicks would have been very, very meaningful too. And Jakeem Grant, every time he gets he gets the ball, I mean, you, you see that punt return that he took, he juked a defender, took it from the 30 up to the 50. The Dolphins end up kicking a field goal on that drive to bring it within eight points at 28 to 20. Should have been a big play, but when you're just completely getting run off the field on defense, a lot of times it doesn't matter. Paul, I'm going to go with my star and my jackass of the week first this week. I'm going to go in the second week in a row with Laramie Tunzel. I think this is an emerging star, a Pro Bowl caliber player. Back-to-back weeks, he shuts down elite performers. And I, I look forward to seeing more and more of what he's going to bring to the table. Jackass of the week, I mean – just so many to choose from. I don't even know where to begin, but I, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Cameron Wake. I mean, even though Wake had some pressures, I don't see a lot that he's bringing to the table. And this is supposed to be one of the elite defenders on the team. And through seven games, even though he's missed a handful of them, he has one sack on the air and he's not good against the run either. So I, he's, he's the guy that should be bringing it to the table and he's not. Who's your star in your jackass of the week? I'm going to go ahead and give it to Devontae Parker. I mean, I, I've said most of my piece on him uh, already, but we saw what he could be if he could get his head out of his ass. Uh, for one game, we got to see what he could be. It's a shame it was wasted on this effort. Uh, I can only imagine if he was playing motivated and focused with a real quarterback. But all in all, what a phenomenal game from him. And for the jackass of the game, like you said, there's a lot of options we could pick from. And I'm going to let our listeners in on a little bit of a secret that before the season, Kat and I sat down and we talked, said we wouldn't pick a coach and we would keep to an individual player when we we did these. So can't go Matt Burke, can't go Adam Gase here, can't go the entirety of the D-line here. I'm going to go TJ McDonald. I think this might be the second week in a row I've said TJ, but he continues to play atrociously and bring down the play of that entire secondary right now. He blew his coverage on that Bobby McCain one that, like you said, uh, he's suddenly atrocious in run support, takes bad angles, continues to be that linchpin in in long runs week after week after week. It's got to be TJ for me, and I don't understand why he's still the starter. I'm with you there. Well, Paul, we did it. We did it. We made it through a 19-point loss and talking about it when the loss should have been worse. There's so many, We could probably have another show on how many people are to blame 
from Adam Gase to Mike Tannenbaum to Matt Burke to the injuries to everything. The Dolphins are still 4-4 four four right now. They, they should get Ryan Tannehill back this coming week against the Jets. They return home. If they can get to 5-4 and four and pull off a few wins later in the year, maybe they can make some things interesting. But, man, it's been rough for four of the last five weeks, I'll tell you that. Anything else you want to add here? Hey, I'm not blaming this at all, but I just have to throw in a little drop here. As, you know, on a day that for the first time in the Super Bowl era, an official was fired during the season, how embarrassing would it have to be to be the head of officiating right now and watch this crew call this game and just all the goofy, dumbass mistakes that came out of this officiating crew, all the embarrassing calls, and really just how goofy it was just watching these officials try to officiate a game. Like it was a couple of dads that got pulled into it at, at a youth game because the officials didn't show up. The, yeah. You guys were an embarrassment as a crew. Yeah, it was, it, and it seems to be getting worse every week. So yeah. we'll see where it goes from here. It should be interesting. That will do it for our breakdown of the Dolphins' loss to the Houston Texans on Thursday Night Football. You can follow Paul and I on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. Also, check out our merch store, too, on the com. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take us out. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. It ain't the left side or the right side.